Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. The story of Swindon-born film star Diana Dawes is one of fame, glamour and intrigue. From the moment she came into the world, her life was full of drama. Her acting career began in the shadow of the Second World War, entering the film world as a vulnerable young teenager and negotiating the difficult British studio system of the 1940s and 50s. Yet she battled against the odds to become one of the most iconic British actors of the 20th century. Why Diana Dawes' taste in men destroyed her career. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Inside Diana Dawes' Explosive Life Steamy Life and Times of Diana Dawes As famous for her not very private life as for her screen performances, Diana Dawes spent much of her career being touted as Britain's answer to Marilyn Monroe. Though this certainly helped her profile and has ensured her immortality, it also tended to work against a genuine talent as an actress and comedienne. Dawes was very much her own creation. Her personality was huge, her appetite for the good life, including champagne, love, cars, mink and all the showy accoutrements of fame, seemingly infinite. And she predated Monroe as an actress, getting her first screen role at 16 in the 1946 film The Shop at Sly Corner. Her role models had been an earlier vintage. Hollywood sirens of the 30s and 40s such as Veronica Lake, Lana Turner and Jean Harlow. But at the height of her career, she had more in common with continental sex bombs, Brigitte Bardot, Gina Lola Brigida and Anita Ekberg. She described herself with characteristic candour as the only sex symbol Britain has produced since Lady Godiva. She looks utterly artificial but behaves completely naturally. No wonder we fell for her. Diana's image seemed to be everything, but there was more to her than the blonde bombshell reputation suggested. A talented actor, she worked on numerous film and television projects, building a fascinating career that spanned decades. Set against the backdrop of the changing social landscape of 20th century Britain, this video charts the ups and downs of her diverse acting career and her tumultuous private life to build a fascinating picture of a truly unique British screen icon. Her real name was Diana Fluck, but her mother said she should change it because there was always the chance that her name would be up in lights outside a cinema and one of the letters might fall off. She came close to death during a difficult birth that also nearly claimed her mother, Mary. Her father, Bert, worked in the accounts office of the Swindon GWR Works, and the small family lived at 210 Marlborough Road. Diana, who had to wear a patch as a young girl to correct a lazy eye, had naturally brown hair, but by the time she was eight, the pupil at the private Selwood House School in Bath Road was already writing essays about becoming a glamorous film star. Mature beyond her years, Dawes was flirting with American GIs at Swindon Army Camp when she was 12, though she could have passed for 18. Stardom was always what she craved. She had her attention grabbed by the big screen from an early age. She became the youngest ever student at London Academy of Music and Drama Art. She was 14, though people believed she was older. She left behind a town that she had outgrown before her 15th birthday including a young Desmond Morris, with whom she had danced the jitterbug at the Bradford Hall, now the Arts Centre in Devizes Road. Diana excelled in her first year at Lambda, and with a new stage name, Dawes was her grandmother's maiden name, and newly dyed blonde hair, she quickly began to win small film roles. 1947 saw her appear in her first film, The Shop at Sly Corner, aka Code of Scotland Yard. It was originally just a walk-on part, but later developed into a speaking role. It was during this time her name was changed to Diana Dawes. Holiday Camp with Jack Warner and Dancing with Crime with Richard Attenborough soon followed, and she was accepted into a school for young actors. Set up by J. Arthur Rank, she was already an established film actress. Her first major role was in the 1948 film Here Come the Huggets, again alongside Jack Warner and she had a leading role in Diamond City a year later. 
but it was Lady Godiva Rides Again which launched her as a sex symbol after the American Board of Film Censors temporarily banned the film for being too risque and later insisted Diana's navel be covered up for the US version. Her success was such that, age 17, with money rolling in, she brought a Delahaye Roadster, 175S, for £5,000, equivalent to £100,000 today, before she'd even passed a driving test, and in 1951 the girl born in humble beginnings in Kent Road became the youngest registered owner of a Rolls-Royce in the UK. To say Diana was on a roll would be an understatement, and most importantly for an actress, her timing matched perfectly with her ambition. By 1953, Marilyn Monroe had become a huge star on the other side of the Atlantic, and at home people were already looking to Diana to become Britain's very own version of the blonde bombshell. It was only a matter of time before she had a shot at Hollywood. Publicists were keen to put her in the Monroe bracket, though her talents were underestimated. When she was asked about starting, in the same way that Marilyn Monroe started, you posed in the all together for photographers and uh, as a model, did you not? Her response was rapid. No, I didn't, she replied. I was given a part in a film and by the time I was 15, I was under contract to the rank organisation and then I made something like 23 pictures by the time I was 17. Certainly Dawes had quite the roller coaster career. After World War II, having grown up enraptured by Hollywood glamour, she studied acting while paying her way as a model, but her burgeoning reputation as an actor was often undercut by her tabloid notoriety, her eventful love life making more headlines than her very genuine talent. In 1956's Yield to the Night, she wowed critics as a Ruth Ellis-esque character awaiting execution for murder, but a subsequent stint over in Hollywood soon fizzled out. Before long she was revealing all about her celebrity parties to the news of the world for a quick payout. Diana was typecast in a lot of her early roles. Some of those femme fatale and bad girl type roles she did were pure typecasting. Her performance in Yield to the Night should have been the making of her. She should have been a big star, but through life choices and poor decisions or just bad luck she didn't quite get there. She kept acting though, and I think people forget that. She was a big star in the 50s and during the 60s. She was a bit of a scandal because of some of the stuff in her personal life. That often overshadows her career journey, which is really fascinating when you look at the roles she took on through the 60s, 70s and into the 80s. She had one terrible flaw in her character, her taste in men. Frequently cast in films as a good time girl, she fell for bad guys in real life. At least one of the men ruined her chances in Hollywood and damaged her reputation at home. Aware of her attributes, she indulged her appetites for men with a number of lovers, married and unmarried, and often exposed herself to exploitation as a result. She went to Tinseltown with her then-husband, Dennis Hamilton, who she'd married in 1951. The Caxton Hall wedding between Diana and Dennis Hamilton wasn't the smoothest of affairs. Before the ceremony, the couple had posed for pictures outside. Hamilton had tipped off the press. But eventually the registrar tapped Hamilton on the shoulder and asked for a quiet word. The official discreetly told him that he had received an anonymous phone call with the information that the marriage application had been forged. Hamilton, furious, grabbed the registrar by the throat and shouted, "'You'll marry us, all right, or I'll knock your teeth down your throat!' An actor turned salesman, he was an exploitative and violent man who took control of her business affairs. It was this shameless flaunting of her sexuality that caused no end of problems with the conservative mavens of Britain and the Catholic League of Decency in the US, reaching its apotheosis when she was condemned by the Archbishop of Canterbury following revelations about wild parties engaged in with then-husband. Hamilton was a con man, unpredictable and arrogant playboy who had been the protégé of homosexual actor Eric Portman. It was Dennis's personality that really bowled me over, she once said. Added to that, a dazzling smile charmed everyone, regardless of what they thought about him, his motives or principles. Not that he had any of the latter, as I was to discover. I never fell in love with Dennis nor loved him in the truest sense of the word. Rather, I was the fly caught in the spider's web. 
Dawes took Hamilton, who had inveigled his way into her bed, her bank account and her career. He was a mean drunk and took to beating her up on a regular basis. He boasted about her earnings, most of which he stole for his nefarious schemes, thus indirectly getting her into trouble with a UK taxman. I was married to a virtual stranger, she recalled. It was so sickening that I began to hate Dennis, almost as much as I hated myself for being so stupid. Following the success of the last page in which Diana was presented as a fully-fledged toxic blonde like Jean Harlow, US producer Robert Lippert offered her a one-picture deal on one condition, that she divorce Hamilton. She refused and Lippert gave the part to someone else. When Burt Lancaster offered her a role in His Majesty O'Keefe, Hamilton turned down the part on her behalf. For her 21st birthday party, Hamilton invited 80 guests along with 20 call girls, and it very quickly developed into a wild party. The final straw came when Hamilton arranged a big party to celebrate Diana's arrival in Hollywood, with a guest list that included Jar Jar Gabor, Ginger Rogers, Lana Turner, Doris Day, Liberace, John Wayne and Eddie Fisher. It was to be the Ding Dong of the Year, co-hosted by their friend the celebrity hairdresser Teasy Weezy Raymond. Half an hour into the party, Diana and Hamilton, plus Diana's US agent and a dress designer, were posing for photos by the pool, when pressmen surged forward, toppling all four into the pool. Hamilton emerged furious, punched the nearest photographer to the ground and kicked him in the head until he lost consciousness. The National Enquirer headline read, Ms. Dawes, go home, and take Mr. Dawes with you. Sadly, she had already reached the peak of her career and never became the international star that her success in Britain had seemed to promise. Bad press from incidents involving her husband and a scandalous affair with Rod Steiger did not help her popularity, and her Hollywood films failed to make an impact. Her career was now in serious decline and she was finding it increasingly difficult to find the highly paid roles to match her expensive lifestyle. The 1960s were not a good decade for Diana Dawes. Divorce from second husband, comedian Dickie Dawson, plus bankruptcy and the gradual drying up of worthwhile roles, suggested her career was coming to an end. But she was ready to bounce back, and it was partly the Beatles she had to thank for renewed public interest. It really is terrifying how gullible and naive I was, and still am, she confessed. I fell for hard luck stories the way boys fall for girls, to make things worse, I surrounded myself with gangsters, conmen and phonies. Dawes spent much of her life unluckily in love. By the time she had arrived at husband number three, Alan Lake, troubled as he was and plagued by alcohol problems, it was evident that she had found some peace in her love life. They had 16 years together, and when she succumbed at 52 to ovarian cancer, Lake could not cope with the loss. After decades of abuse at the hands of men, Diana Dawes had finally found someone who loved her more than life itself. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Diana Dawes? Before her death, Diana claimed to have hidden two million pounds in banks and left behind a mysterious code, but the whereabouts remain a mystery.